Thanks, everybody. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was sitting in my office of World Wildlife Fund with uh, Mahendra Shrestha and John Seidensticker, and we were going over some of the, the really alarming news of uh, the trends in tiger populations across the 13 countries uh, that tigers occur in, in, in what we call these tiger conservation landscapes that we had helped identify and map uh, a few years ago. And it was very clear to us that what we were seeing in, t in wild tigers was what biologists call a range collapse, is that tigers were now occupying much less area than they used to. And to put quite simply, is that what we were doing just wasn't working at all, that we were on the road to seeing populations go extinct across the range. And so we had to try something really different. And the idea came into our heads that we should adopt an approach that we applied very successfully in the Congo Basin a few years ago to form the Congo Basin Forest Partnership. And what happened more recently um, with the Coral Triangle Initiative of six countries in Southeast Asia that share the, the richest deposits of coral and coral reef fish in the world is to create an, and stage a, a global summit to bring together world leaders to address a critical environmental problem. And so we thought that this is what was needed for tigers, but that was kind of a pipe dream three years ago. And now today, we've seen that we are on the way to actually uh, staging that summit in Vladivostok in 2010 in the year of the tiger. The first critical step towards that was uh, the workshop that we had in Kathmandu. And uh, four months ago, if you had asked me, is there any chance at all that we're going to pull this off, I would have said, Probably not. We were kind of embroiled in some political uh, uh, imbroglios that only tiger biologists can get themselves into and uh, trying to figure our way out of that. And it wasn't clear uh, how much cooperation or how prepared the government of Nepal was to host this meeting. But I remember uh, the words of my dear friend Himanta Mishra, who I worked with for many years in wildlife conservation in Nepal, and he said, you know, in Nepal, the possible is often impossible, but the impossible is often possible. And in fact, that's what was happened, is something that we thought was impossible to bring together the heads of, of conservation and range states to formulate an action plan, the beginning of a blueprint for the, uh, the stabilization and recovery of wild tigers was actually launched. And I really do think that it was a piece of history being made. I'm going to share just a few of the observations from that and then talk about some of the challenges, just like the ones we faced just to get to Kathmandu, that we faced to get to Vladivostok and why I think it needs all of your help and attention. So one of the first analyses that we presented in Kathmandu was one that um, would make a lot of sense to any wildlife biologist. We have a species undergoing a range collapse, and we know that tigers are mostly breeding in some core protected areas. There are 324 protected areas within the, the tiger's range. And so the obvious solution, if you've got a limited amount of resources and, and um, expertise and uh, enforcement power in the field, is to concentrate all of your efforts around those core breeding areas, because that's the source populations for saving tigers over the long term. And we did an analysis of that, given that tigers are extremely territorial and that uh, they, they're very wide ranging and area sensitive, is that if you took just say the 60 core breeding areas where you have perhaps more than 25 breeding tigers occurring in an area, you would, and, and you put all of your resources into just protecting those 60 or so reserves, the end result would be that you'd be protecting about 3,200 tigers, which is what we have today. And if you add in another, say, 55 or 60 reserves that are peripheral to those core breeding areas to make a slightly larger complex, you get all the way up to about 4,000 tigers. So the clear message here, then, is that if you really want to stage a recovery of tigers and you want to get to a goal, say, of doubling the wild tiger population, then you need to go to the landscape scale. You need to embrace conservation at the scale of these tiger conservation landscapes that we have identified. And so that was our challenge. And one of the great things about the Kathmandu recommendations and the workshop is that I think that we're much closer now 
to a global agreement um, that our slogan for the summit and for the way forward is going to be to double the number of tigers um, by the year 2022, which is the next year of the tiger. So 7,000 tigers by 2022. Now, we have the capacity to do that because within the tiger's range, there's still about 1.1 million square kilometers of tiger habitat. So that means that we can easily support between 20 and 30,000 wild tigers. So 7,000 tigers is, is within the realm. But to get there, we have to do landscape scale conservation. And to get there, we have to go far beyond just the protected areas. And that's why we need the help of the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and many of the other groups that focus perhaps more of their effort outside those protected areas than in the core reserves. So just this morning, I was working on a series of maps to prepare for the, the Kathmandu recommendations to go out to all the range states. And the page I was working on was a series of maps with my colleague Jessica Forrest, who's back there now. Um, is a series of maps that look at the, uh, the, the multi-dimensional value of tiger conservation landscapes for humanity. One of the maps looks at carbon density. Uh, so the tiger conservation landscapes not just are the place to conserve tigers, but they represent probably the highest densities of forest carbon in the region. So there's an obvious benefit there, and with Copenhagen going on right now, and someday in the future we'll have a red treaty or a red plus treaty, these same landscapes that are important for tigers will also be important for conserving the important reservoirs of forest carbon. They're also the most intact forests that are found within the tiger conservation landscape. So any type of wise use and sustainable extraction of timber products and non-timber forest products are going to come from tiger conservation landscapes. They're also the most important water towers in Asia. By water towers, I mean those pieces of habitat that provide most of the sources of fresh water for densely uh, populated areas across the tiger range. And finally, the same tiger conservation landscapes are where most of the, uh, the globally important biodiversity of Asia is concentrated. So tigers truly act as umbrella species within their range. And we'll have those maps available for everybody to see, but they provide four very good reasons for somebody who doesn't give a damn about tigers to still be very concerned about conserving these same habitats because of all these ecological and environmental services they bring to humanity. That's a piece of the message that we have to take forward to the ministers in Thailand in the meeting coming up in January. Not everybody is going to love tigers as much as we do, but we'll certainly value these habitats and their preservation and conservation as very good reasons for joining in this process on the road to Vladivostok. Our big challenges are going to be from here to, to, to Thailand and on to a, um, a donor roundtable and on to Vladivostok. I think is to we're, going to, we're going to get the political will. I believe that. I think that um, we can summon that same support that we tried to bring together and successfully brought together in the, for the Congo Basin and the Coral Triangle. I also believe that there's going to be a tremendous outpouring of goodwill and concern uh, among all the people uh, around many countries. Tigers are by far the most popular animal on the planet, even more so than giant pandas. I um, hate to say from my own organization, our, our logo takes a second seat, back seat to tigers. That's a good thing. So e almost everybody loves tigers. And how we use that, that, how we transform that concern and goodwill, particularly when people realize, my God, there only may be as few as 3,200 tigers left in the wild, how we take that goodwill and then apply that to pressuring governments, um, to providing the resources to really stage this stabilization, which we have to do first, and stop the bleeding of the poaching of tigers going on in the wild, and then stage this recovery to get back to 7,000 tigers by 2022. It's really our, our, our most important mission. And to do that, we're going to need a number of sustainable financing mechanisms, whether it's um, revenues from ecotourism, whether it's transfer mechanisms from development that's going to occur in the tiger range. One of the important points we learned at the Kathmandu workshop is that there is an, uh, an estimate of between 500 billion and a trillion dollars per year going